right hey folks so today we are going to be talking about appetite and hunger and something which is known as the protein leverage theory and how that can influence um, whether you get hungry or not and how you can use that to satisfy your hunger throughout the day and use it to your advantage basically so um, let's get straight into it now this is a hypothesis which was put forward by a guy called Dr. Kevin Hall. At least that's where I first heard of it. And uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant doctor who's done a lot of research in the area, mostly about hunger and how various types of diets influence the hunger that we feel. Um, so one phrase that I've sort of heard over the years is never go food shopping when you're hungry, right? You probably heard a variation of that wherever you're from. The idea being that if you're really hungry and you're going for a food shop, you might be tempted to get some of the more convenient snacks just so you can have them and satisfy your hunger because you're just surrounded by all this food. So appetites and desires of all kinds tend to be weakened um, when you are really feeling either like hungry or whatever else, and it can lead to poor decision-making process. So for example, around food, um, I've also written examples here of like sexual and anger. Um, so like if you're really horny, uh, you know, and you're young on a night out and you're really horny, you may well make the wrong decisions for your future <laughs> um, or on that night. And it's something to kind of bear in mind. And I think when those feelings are very intensified, like when you're very, very hungry or when you have other kind of urges, generally your brain starts to switch off a little bit <laughs> and your instinct takes over. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. So from what I've seen with regards to diet, um, with the people that sort of I've known over the years, in my experience, a lack of control in other areas of life tends to accompany a lack of control with food. This is just anecdotal that I've seen. So um, people who typically have a difficult time with their uh, anger, for example, um, they also can have bad relationships with food because it's sort of that same lack of control, lack of mastery that they encounter with one thing, which then transfers over to the other, because it's just part and parcel of the same personality type. Not always, but as I say, anecdotally, it's just something that I've seen. So now, um, the protein leverage theory is something which was brought up by, yeah, Dr. Kevin Hall. And um, essentially, it's this, it's essentially the idea that while we can store carbohydrates and fat in our body, we can't really store protein in a way which is easy to deposit and withdraw. So like carbs can be stored as a collection, very, very easy to deposit in them and, and, and withdraw. Um, fat is relatively easy to withdraw, fairly easy to deposit, but protein, not so much. We can store it as muscle, of course, but um, it's quite an expensive process to create muscle. You also have to have the stimulus to do so. And then to break it down, it's, it's it's more of a last resort than than a first resort. So the idea is this, that we have a certain protein need per day. Now that protein need will vary based on our size, our physical activity, how much protein renewal we need. Like for example, um, a sedentary person who doesn't train with weights probably doesn't need that much. I think the government guidelines are probably okay for a person of that a situation, maybe more like, I don't know, um, a kilo per pound of body weight. Um, for somebody who lifts weights, it's probably closer to 0.8 grams per pound, so almost a gram per pound of body weight, assuming their reasonable body fat. And that will cover the amount of protein that they need for a given day. So that's the initial basis of the protein leverage hypothesis. Now, the hypothesis says that the human body will carry on eating until it feels like it's gotten enough. So the way that Dr. Kevin Hall puts it is, the protein leverage model of obesity posits that decreasing the protein fraction of the diet leads to compensatory increases in total energy intake in an attempt to maintain the target amount of absolute protein consumed. What he's, he's trying to explain why when we're eating foods which don't have a very high protein content, like chocolate, potato chips, whatever, why do we keep eating them? And his idea is that we keep eating them because the body inherently knows we don't have the protein necessary for daily function, so it keeps on wanting food. Now, it's not intelligent enough to know to say, hey, stop eating those potato chips and actually slam that protein shake or that steak, but it says, I want energy. I mean, the, the way that the body has evolved, it's, it's not 
been evolved to be how to have access to all those foods. So typically when the body says, I want food, it's looking for something which is probably less processed. So the protein leverage theory attempts to um, state why we keep wanting food, even when we may well have far exceeded our daily caloric requirements. So the calorie requirements are way overblown. Let's say your maintenance is 2,000 calories. You've eaten three, four, 5,000, but you're still hungry. You might feel sick of yourself, but you're still hungry. Why does that happen? That happens because of this, because from what Dave, Dr. Kevin Hall is saying is depending on your food choices, you may still need to meet your protein requirement. And it's not always that... Um, it's not always that obvious. It's more like if your maintenance is, you know, 2,000 calories, you might consistently be eating 2,500 or 2,300. That's far more likely. And why do we want this just slightly over all the time? Why is it that at the end of the day, when you've put in all your calories into my fitness pal, why are you still hungry? Like partly, Dr. Kevin Hall says it's partly because of this, because the amount of protein in our diets of modern day tends to be decreased as a proportion and so we need more overall food. That's his general sort of idea. So if you think about this kind of practically, now, how hungry are you after a large bolus of protein throughout the day? So if you've had a protein, uh, a con let's say you've had a, a breakfast, which has got something like 50 grams of protein, you've had lunch, 50 grams, dinner, 50 grams, maybe before bed, 50 grams, 200 grams of protein, you're, you're an average size guy. How hungry are you really going to be at that stage? Or let's say you've been out for a meal and you've had a massive friggin' steak, right? And you've been well fed throughout the day, you've had a massive steak. How hungry really are you going to be for the extra dessert? You know, you might fit it in out of pure habit, but you'll be pretty stuffed by that point. So what I know what I've done many times is I've ramped up protein in certain populations, particularly for for people who aren't particularly used to having protein, like um, smaller women who don't weight train, ramping up protein for those populations, almost immediately they say to me, whoa, I could never eat that much. When the reality is they're eating less overall calories than they were previously, but it's because the protein content is that much higher. Like I put smaller females on a diet of roughly 12 to 1300 calories with a high amount of protein, like something in the 150 range. And where there was, they were previously eating more like 50 grams of protein and more like 2,500 calories. And the difference in satiety is insane. So I've done this lots of times, and I've done this with guys as well, and ramped up their protein intake high while keeping overall caloric load really, really, really low. And it works tremendously well, like the classic, you know, meat and vegetables type of PSMF diet that works on that basis as well. Ramp up the protein really, really high. Everything else is really, really low, and you get full. I've talked about this before when it comes to VLCDs, very low calorie diets. If you structure them correctly and you base them around protein sources, meat sources in general, and um, very, very lean vegetables, people get full very quickly. And in fact, their perceived ratings of fullness go up. So there's a definite thing to it. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking to yourself, well, actually, Faz, this is probably for other reasons. It may just be that protein's very filling in itself. Yes, but we're kind of exploring why protein is filling here. Why is it inherently that filling? And um, if we look at, so if we look at the hyperpalatability of processed foods, um, let's take, take a typical example of potato chips and look at what they, what do they add to potato chips? So this is ingredients of uh, just some potato chips that I found online. Potatoes, which is fine. Potatoes are generally very filling, but what have they added? They've added sunflower oil and dextrose. So basically they've added, directly added fat and sugar. Now. You, you take something which is actually very filling, like a, a potato. Potatoes are generally very filling. And you add in a bunch of sugar and fat. So we say a lot of, a lot of people who are in the sort of fitness industry and talk about hyperplatability of foods say that added sugar and fat is like the enemy or processed food is the bane of society for the reasons of, you know, added sugar, or added fat, you know, whatever camp you might belong to, like the... Um, the low carb camp always say that sugar is the problem and they always say the fat is fine. And the, the other guys always say that fat is fine and sugar is, you know, whatever. So everyone has their little camps. But what if the problem was actually that the it's proportionally lower protein intake? So you've got all these people like the, you know, the almost keto crowd saying, well, actually it's the sugar that's the problem. And you've got the other guys saying, well, actually, no, it's the fat that's the problem. What if the real problem is it's just not enough protein? Because by adding in all this stuff, 
right? What we've done is we've lowered the proportion of protein in there by increasing the amount of other stuff. And potato chips are a decent example, but you think of an example like chocolate. I mean, how much does chocolate differ from raw cacao? It's crazy. If you look up the ingredient list for chocolate, it is extensive. It goes on to three lines. There's so many things they add into that, you know, and it's all various forms of sugar and fat. They add it all in and it makes it hyperplatable, but it also reduces the fraction of fiber and protein. So what Dr. Kevin Hall is saying is that actually it's not so much, or maybe it's in addition to the sugar and fat, but people are overlooking actually that we're not taking enough protein. And actually the body has a very good way of regulating how much protein it needs. And if you think about it, that does make sense. I mean, we need muscle to survive. And I'm not just talking about fancy, you know, muscles like biceps and whatever, right? The heart's a muscle, you know? Our skin needs protein to be able to regenerate. Every single organ in our body, every single aspect of our body needs protein to be able to regenerate itself on a daily basis. So it's not out of the realms of possibility that we have some sort of internal clock which tallies up the amount of protein we're taking in roughly over a whatever time period, right? Um, and if we don't have enough of what we need, it continues to ramp up the hunger until we do. Now, the fat is taken care of, the carbs are taken care of, but what if we don't have enough protein? Well, we can't store it. So let's say one day we were low on carbs. Well, who cares? We've got lots of carbs in our body. We can synthesize carbs from fats, but what if we're low on fats? Well, we can, you know. So, but what if we're low on protein? Well, we can't synthesize that from just out of anything. So we have to be able to eat it. So the body will just continue to ramp up its desire for food because it's not intelligent enough to go, look, Faz, go to the freezer and, you know, slam some chicken breast. Like, <laughs> you know, it'll just say, feed me. So that's kind of the idea behind what Dr. Kevin Hall is saying. So the next question is, if that's true, um, what does it mean? Like, it means that, well, we can't just eat, quote unquote, healthy. Okay. We have to actually pay attention to the protein we need. And because there are plenty of people who are out there and they eat, you know, according to their diet mantra, whether they're keto, whether they're vegan or whatever, right? Now they might still struggle with appetite, but if you fulfill the amount of protein, you're at least covering that card. So in general, what we say is the sort of threshold from where you don't get any more benefit is roughly 0.8 grams per pound of body weight if you're between roughly 10 to 20 percent body fat as a male or maybe i don't know 15 to 25 as a female or slightly higher other than that if you're a lot heavier you might need a different measurement maybe more like a gram per pound of lean body weight so for example if you're 250 pounds and your body fat percentage is 40 percent you know so let's say you're you're going to be lean at well, let's say your body fat percentage is 50% and you're going to be lean at more like 160 pounds, which is a lot of people. Like a lot of people really um, underestimate how much fat they're holding onto their bodies. Like guys who are walking around thinking at 250 pounds, thinking they're going to be shredded at 200. Like, trust me, you're not. I, I got on stage at 180 pounds and you guys know how big I was. So when I, when I, when I hit stage 2018, so, you know, it's not as <laughs> everyone's always a lot, lean, everyone's always a lot smaller than they think. Uh, so, if you are that big and you've got that level of body fat on you, then it may be better to aim for something like a gram per pound of lean body weight. Other than that, the final metric, which also works, is one gram per centimeter of height. That also works pretty well. So if you're about, you know, 181 centimeters, I think I'm about there, about 180 grams of protein will cover you. You know, if you're a natural guy, that's a pretty decent amount. So that much, as long as you're getting that into your into your dietary plan somehow, you're probably doing what's best to ensure that your appetite and your hunger probably reflect more true caloric needs rather than just this almost artificial elevation of caloric needs because you're not getting in enough protein because you're eating a lot of foods which aren't high in protein, basically. So yeah, um, hopefully you found that interesting. Um, essentially, it's just a call to eating more protein in your diet and that diet adherence is less and less about just eating non-processed foods. It's more about actually making sure you're getting enough macros that you need as well. Protein is a popular one, of course. So hopefully you know that already, but 
this might find might be interesting and it might be a different angle into um, some of the science behind it. But it's an interesting theory. If you want to do, know more about it, uh, look up Dr. Kevin Hall and his theories on the protein leverage hypothesis. So I'll call it there and I'll speak to you guys in the next one.